of a psychedelic therapeutics investment fund called Palo Santo. He believes psychedelics are poised to shift the paradigm in mental health treatment, and his primary mission is to invest in companies and solutions that allow for broad access to those most in need of mental health care. For more information about our guest, Palo Santo, and this topic, visit our episode page at moveconsciousness.com slash Palo Santo. That's moveconsciousness.com slash P-A-L-O-S-A-N-T-O. All right, let's get started. All right, welcome to the show, Tim. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on, Steve. Glad you're here. Happy to have you here. So why don't you tell me a little bit about your organization and a little bit about your background? Yeah, so I'll um, I'll start with my background, and then I think that feeds a lot into how Palo Santo came to be. But um, it's a blending of professional and, and kind of personal interest in the space. So professionally, my entire career has been in healthcare and finance. So started my career in investment banking across J.P. Morgan and Greenhill and Company, two New York-based investment banks. Um, really focused on, I was in their healthcare verticals there, so focused on the life sciences space primarily during that time. And then from there, moved over to Madison Dearborn Partners, which is a Chicago-based private equity fund, and was really focused on healthcare services during my time there. So more site-based, kind of clinic-based models, a little bit of healthcare tech sprinkled in there, where I think that has relevancy to psychedelics is we really are seeing the psychedelic movement take on more of a medicalized form than a mm-hmm. recreational form. And I think this, and we can hit on this throughout our conversation, but I think this is going to go through a very different business model than we've seen cannabis, the path cannabis go down. So um, certainly has a lot of bearing on that as the business models look quite different um, for the psychedelic companies emerging. And then personally, um, have always had an attachment to mental health, um, given my own battle with mental, you know, mental health and, and depression over 15 years ago. And, and more importantly, seeing a number of family members really have close brushes. I saw firsthand how lacking the standard of care was in so many ways and said, hey, there's got to be a better way to do this. And for a long time, had that in the back of my head of it just felt like SSRIs were taking a sledgehammer to a problem where we should probably have a scalpel. There really hasn't been a lot of innovation in that area for quite a while, right? Very minimal innovation. I think the last major tool we had for mental health was, yeah, SSRIs, so the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, yeah. Yeah, which are really, if you look at the mechanism of action there, it is, it, it really is, you're kind of like, it's like a napalm type approach to a problem that's probably a lot more refined. Right. And it takes several months to see if it's working, and then you have to that deal with too. the side effects, and you might not get it right the first time, you might have to Almost come off things. of it and start a new one, yeah. For about a third of people only, they work, so knew it was lacking, and about four years ago, um, saw the clinical data coming out on psychedelics out of academic institutions like Johns Hopkins, Imperial College London, NYU, you name it. And for me, I'm very attuned to clinical data from the world I come from um, in life sciences and biotech. And I'm like, I was like, okay, you know, once you have data in humans, that's really compelling. And the efficacy rates were pretty remarkable. So that steered me in a direction to start looking at this space a lot more for a number of years. And I'd say COVID was really the catalyst where I think psychedelics really took off and drew a lot of attention. And that was when we formed Palo Santo, where we said, okay, we've been in this ecosystem for a long time. We've cultivated a really deep network in the space. And now we have the right ingredients where I think a lot more focus is being put on mental health. And people are willing to assess any type of treatments out there, any protocols, since we know how lacking the current standard is. So um, that was the real genesis about a year ago. And since then, we've raised a $35 million fund um, we've deployed about 15 million of that across over 20 companies in the space. And it's been a really exciting journey. Wow, it's impressive. Thank you. 35 million, uh, it's, it's no joke. So yeah, it's a nice chunk of change. That, it's a nice chunk sure. of change. You can so, do a yeah, lot But that. I mean, the, the problem where, you know, it feels like a drop in the ocean relative to the problem we're trying to address. So yeah. it's, uh, in some ways, I'm like, I'm proud of the accomplishment, but it does feel like a Sisyphean task in some ways if I kind of see the mountain we still have to climb to really, you know, get these treatments to market and, and the capital needs required to do that. So it's a long way to go. Yeah. So let's talk about that. What are some of the major goals and missions for the organization? What are you doing with all this money? Yeah. So our main focus is on psychedelic biotech, which is a very different beast from recreational. So, you know, mm-hmm. recreational, you are focused more on revenue metrics and you can see some immediate profitability, some proof of concept. Uh, on that, it's more of a brick and mortar approach in a lot of cases, is my understanding of cannabis, where you're actually setting up storefronts. So very different world in cannabis here. 
you're going through an FDA clinical trial approval process. So you're dealing with businesses that are not going to generate any revenue for probably seven to eight years until they commercialize a product. So you're going through multiple phases of FDA drug development, just like the vaccines we recently had released went through in a more expedited manner or any other drug right. that you get a prescription for. They go through a rigorous clinical trial approval process where you can determine, okay, this drug does cure this illness and there's statistical significance around it rather than nootropics or more recreational stuff where that's murky, people make claims that aren't always substantiated. So these go through a very long process. It requires a lot of capital, anywhere from 100 to $200 million to go through a full clinical trial. So it requires a lot of capital needs. But on the back end, companies that succeed in that endeavor are pretty valuable. I mean, the patient populations we're dealing with here are, you look at depression alone, it's over 400 million people globally. It's a really large market to address. And so that's why you see companies worth so much. A tie is valued at $3 billion. You even look at GW Pharma in the cannabis space that was advancing medicalized cannabinoids. They had Epidiolex for childhood seizures that sold to Jazz Pharma for $7 billion. So there is tremendous upside in the space if you do succeed. Um, but it's it's also a journey you know, laden with a lot of landmines too. A lot of drugs fail in the process. So it's kind of a high risk, high reward approach. And the way you evaluate businesses is quite different. It's much more mechanistic and pharmacological, trying to get an assessment of, is this drug, do we think this will actually work in patients um, mm -hmm. and succeed in FDA trials? And another part of that is not just the drug, but organizations like MAPS are looking at, a part of that is going to be a training program for yes. psychedelic therapists. Yes. So that not just whole... not just the drug, but the treatment. Yeah, that is a whole other interesting part of this space and we're still trying to see how this is going to emerge because usually what you patent around a drug is the drug, the compound, if you can, and the delivery method of that compound that, you know, whether it's however you formulate it, whether it's a pill you take, infusion, there's a lot of different delivery methods um, and, and ways to deliver those. So um, what's interesting about psychedelics is psychotherapy and that whole protocol seems to be a critical component of how you deliver this therapy but how do you develop IP around that? Can you develop IP around that? That is an absolutely critical component. And then to your point, there's a whole training component to this as well. So that's why we like, there's some companies out there like Journey Clinical, for example, that we're invested in where we really like their approach. They're leveraging the existing infrastructure of psychotherapists already out there and really empowering them to deliver, you know, to deliver psychotherapy or to deliver psychedelic therapies in their clinics rather than having to go out and train a whole new clinician base you're kind of leveraging the backbone that already exists out there um, right. that's a whole other component and will be a bottleneck in this ecosystem and many of these therapists have existing patients that would benefit from this they're already being seen for things like depression that too exactly but, I, and i like but that. given the trend we still have this huge deficit of people who are going to be trained properly to deliver Oh, psychedelic absolutely. assisted therapy yeah I, it's gonna be a big a big bottleneck i mean field trip just announced uh they, they had a press release where they're now allowing psychotherapists who already have their own practice to come into field trip clinics and deliver the therapy in the clinic but there's going to be more of a profit sharing there rather than field trip owning the whole, the whole model which i think is um that's definitely an interesting phase shift in the space of kind of an acknowledgement that okay we're having a tough time finding and training all the clinicians we would want in-house and we need to start outsourcing this. And that's where I, I, I think what Journey Clinical is doing is, is incredibly smart. I think for a lot of independent psychotherapists, they don't wanna work for the man either. They don't wanna be under a big <laughs> umbrella of a big corporation that owns that whole process. I like this idea of democratizing and empowering existing clinicians that are already out there and who are trained psychotherapists as is. Where this is more of an adjacency, you know, of tacking on learning psychedelic assisted psychotherapy rather than training someone from the ground up who has no experience in this space at all. Yeah, perhaps trying to learn from some of our previous mistakes with drug development. <laughs> yeah, yeah exa exactly. So people who've kind of been in this and, and they know what, you know, they know what psychotherapy is like, they know what treating depressed patients already is like. So um, I like that model in a lot of ways. Yeah. So I noticed there's quite a big variety and a lot of diversity in the types of companies that you guys have chosen to support. Yes, yes, there's, and that was part of our thesis when we started Palo Santo was thinking through, you know, okay, if these, if these are only good for depression, anxiety, PTSD, and, you know, and some addiction disorders, 
that's still pretty limiting in terms of your market, your investable opportunity set um, and, and your market opportunity there, even where we were like, OK, if we're going to start a fund, this has to go far beyond that in terms of the indications that can be addressed and also the compounds available to address those. So starting with indications, we do have a sense that it's, there's probably upwards of 25 potential indications you could go after with psychedelic therapies. So some are in psychiatry, the classic mood disorders, but even outside of that, like Eleusis is tackling Alzheimer's, for example, with LSD. There is interesting data right. on neurogenesis um, with LSD, which is quite compelling. So neurodegenerative disorders in general could be a whole other area to pursue. Eleusis also is going after inflammatory disorders as well. There's really good data to suggest that psychedelics are potent anti-inflammatories, in particular psilocybin, or the mescaline class, which falls under a category called phenethylamines more broadly, um, seem to be potent anti-inflammatories, and some are not nearly as psychoactive as well, where if you're gonna take an anti-inflammatory, you probably don't wanna get a trip every single time you take your anti-inflammatory. So that's, that's another area. I mean, It'd be a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, anorexia, you name it. I mean, there's a wide range of potential indications you could go after, some certainly more speculative, um, but we hold hope on those. And then also for psychedelic analogs or new versions of psychedelics that take inspiration from kind of the generics that we know of already, there's probably a lot of chemical tweaks that can be made to improve on these in a lot of ways to either shorten the duration of the trip. If you want psychoactivity to eliminate the trip as Delix claims to have done, we're investors in Delix, for example. So there's, um, and also there is some liability. There's cardiac liability with a number of these, definitely with Ibogaine. You have Herg inhibition, which creates some cardiac liability. And then even with the classic tryptamines, these, a lot of these activates what's, what's known as the 5-HT2B receptor, which there's, that can create velviopathies if you, if you overactivate that receptor, activate that chronically. So there are but some- Ibogaine, But Ibogaine has gained in popularity, especially because of its um, ability to help with addiction. Yes. Like has. in Canada, it's been popularized for trying to help with opiate addiction. Yes. And that is the trade-off is it does seem highly addictive for treating, you know, opioid addiction, heroin addiction, you name it, anything in that opioid class. It's, it's operating on the same class of receptors are known as kappa opioid receptors. Um, and does seem to offer powerful relief that in tandem with 5-HT2A agonism, which is the psychoactive receptor, which we think is what's really generating this kind of trippy experience in a lot of ways. But there's also commercial limitations to Ibogaine. So when Demerex had their clinics in the Car Caribbean, they did have defibrillators. I mean, one in 50 people had adverse events where their heart would stop, basically, <laughs> on Ibogaine. So wow. as a patient, 2% <laughs> risk, I mean, would you go into a treatment if you knew you had a 2% risk? Especially, if, I mean, it was a bigger risk for the really kind of, you know, heavy duty heroin addicts where... I mean, your whole, you've really trashed a lot of your, your heart's probably weakened a lot of, you know, physiologically, you're already pretty weakened in general. So that's a big risk. And it's also a 36 hour trip as well. I mean, that's a long, yeah. from a commercial a standpoint, that's tough to get people to adopt that. So, I mean, Delix is working on an Ibogaine analog, um, Gilgamesh also working on a compound known as Oxa Iboga, which could be more for take home use, seems to have eliminated Herc inhibition, which is where you get this cardiac liability. Um, and those could be far more commercially viable in a lot of ways. So um, I think, you know, I began really compelling, but we do see a lot of potential to take inspiration from these Gen 1 psychedelics and create what are known as Gen 3 psychedelics. Gen 2 is tweaking some of the delivery methods. Gen 3 is bona fide new chemical entities where they are. It's, it's totally new chemical matter you're discovering here, mm -hmm. but building on those scaffolds. So there's just a variety of things that can be happening in the near future. <laughs> yes, it's an exciting ecosystem, that is for sure. Yeah. So, and I see a wide, oh, you know, a wide lane of new drug discovery opening up in this space. Now that I think, for a long time, pharmacologists, medicinal chemists, drug discoverers treated activation of this receptor class as toxic, especially the 5-HT2A receptor that was seen as li you know, a liability with a lot mm -hmm. of drugs. And now we're seeing that actually may be the source of a lot of the therapeutic action for a lot of these compounds. So it's sort of turned the field of pharmacology on its head in a lot of ways to say, okay, maybe psychoactivity isn't a bad thing in drugs. Maybe that isn't something we want to avoid necessarily. So there's a whole bunch of research that was kind of thrown aside for decades that is having a bit of a renaissance here in a lot of ways, kind of reopens this field.
Yeah, that's the importance of research. I mean, originally, scientists thought that the the visual stimulation in trips was because it was a overactivity of the visual cortex. But then they did some research, and it's like, oh, it's actually not there. <laughs> it wasn't what they thought. So you, the more research you do, the more you find out. Okay, where is there more evidence of this, and you can understand a little bit more concretely. Absolutely. Well, that and that is another. You know, I had a discussion about this recently of why are psychedelics going through. A bit of a renaissance now, and one reason I do think COVID, like I mentioned earlier, was a key catalyst in in the revival of this space. That I think we've been willing to look at any options to address mood disorders and mental health more broadly. But I think another thing too is you look at you know back in the '60s and '70s, we just didn't have the pharmacological tools to make a much more first principles assessment of how these drugs work in the body, in the brain. So I mean, a lot of your data was from people ingesting these. And seeing how they react, you didn't have now, you know. And this is as a you know within the past two or three decades, you can get much more down to the receptor level and run assay data on human cell tissue lines and see, okay, is this an agonist? Is this an antagonist? What receptors does this have more affinity for? You can get a lot more mechanistic, and you can show that to regulators to say, okay, this actually isn't as dangerous as we thought. There's limited liability. We just didn't even have that data. So prior to this point, you had just you know heavy psychoactivity, and it's like how do you separate someone tripping on PCP, where we know that's toxic and bad, and they're having a you know really troubling trip, versus LSD, where we there, we know now there's no known overdose of this. There really is limited liability aside from some of that two two B activation, but that's more from chronic use. So we just didn't even have those tools. Not too right. Bad. You can be a lot more precise with your research questions. And- Absolutely you can design studies a lot better. Exactly. But yeah, I mean, they used to just give it out and for free and be like, just tell me about your experience. That's not as precise <laughs> as, you know, ha- trying to test a specific hypothesis before you give out the drug. Exactly. We know from placebo and subjective experience, I mean, the, the it can be so wide ranging what people report that gives you some data, but it's it's not great data. It's, it's a lot yeah. more of a he said, she said. So let's talk about which specific psychedelics do you think are going to be gaining in the most popularity and kind of what areas they're going to be branching off into. Yeah, it's interesting you bring it up because I feel like psilocybin has been the drug du jour for so long and it's a great drug, but you're like, there's so many others outside of that that go unexplored and even a whole range of ethnobotanicals that probably people very rarely talk about. We're investors in... um, you know, in one company working with Schulte's library, Richard Evan Schulte's, who did, he he cultivated a whole ton of ethnobotanicals out there. But psilocybin is a great drug. I actually find 5-MeO-DMT really compelling as well. I mean, just the rapid action of that drug, if you can get the same therapeutic effect in 15 to 30 minutes versus a five to six hour trip, that is really compelling. Now, there's a lot less data around that. There is a lot more we need to figure out. So it is a riskier pathway. Um, but I can also say from anecdotal evidence and experience, there's probably something there to 5-MeO DMT. Which is different than just regular DMT. Yes. DMT that would be smoked and the DMT in ayahuasca are both different than 5-MeO DMT. It's a different yes. chemical structure. Those are NNDMT for what's in ayahuasca versus 5-MeO is it's a 5-methoxy you know, five attached to the NNDMT group. So actually NNDMT is more similar to psilocybin than it is to 5-MeO-DMT. Psilocybin actually, um, it breaks down to psilocin and, oh man, the the chemical name of psilocin is like 4-methyl-dimethyltryptamine. It's something like that. So it's actually much more similar to DMT in a lot of ways. Um, But yeah, 5-MeO kind of, I'd say it's, you know, almost more separated from those two. But that one's really compelling. I mean, Atai is cultivating Salvinorin A. Also, they just launched a portfolio company, I believe, Revixia. Um, is one of their subsidiaries, which could be interesting. That's a bit more speculative around salvia, but there's some evidence around maybe there's some antidepressant effects if you can change delivery or or, or make some tweaks there. Um, but then, you know, even beyond that, I, another area that I don't think a lot of people have looked into enough is the whole phenethylamine class as well. So that's in the mescaline camp, you know, peyote, San Pedro, um, the active compound right. there is mescaline. But there, I mean, Sasha Shulgin did a lot of, you know, 2CB was one of his favorite drugs. Um, and there's a few companies starting to work with 2CB, but I think there's a whole range of phenethylamines, um, which could be, I mean, we still have yet to elucidate what they could be useful for, but 
I wouldn't be surprised if there's something out there. At least they seem to be more targeted is one thing. So they, you know, LSD is a very promiscuous molecule. It activates <laughs> a lot of receptors you want to hit, but a lot of receptors you don't necessarily want to hit or you don't know what they do even. So it's just tough to right. tell versus the phenethylamine class seems to be much more potent at 5-HT2 receptors. So it could be a much more targeted drug class. And like I mentioned earlier, seem to be highly anti-inflammatory too. Which versus be, LSD, which may be more of a Pandora's box. So we know kind of yeah. what we're getting, but not everything. Not everything. It's It yeah. hits so many receptors where that could potentially explain some of the bad trips for a lot of people too. We just, it's so tough to tell with that drug. Yeah. I like the way you're looking at the problem too, or potential problems, because it's not just what can this be used for? What are its indications? But how practical is it that we're going to be able to have people use this in a way that still works in their everyday life. If you can do 5-MeO-DMT in 15 minutes, either at home or even in a clinical setting, it can be done relatively quickly. Yes. You still need to allow time to process, you know, what has happened and really make sure that you're incorporating that and having the integration component. But the actual experience being a short duration, but potent definitely has potential. Agreed. And this is, this is the, I think the interesting thing with 5-MeO is I'm in complete agreement. I think the one thing some people are missing is the necessity of integration, especially with that experience. I mean, when you meet God, it's it's tough to it's tough to make sense of that one. So, you know, GH research I just read, there's very part of their pitch was there's very minimal like pre-integration work for that, which mm -hmm. I think is really dangerous. I think you need you need a lot of prep work around that compound. So what's gonna be interesting is the actual yeah. delivery it's going to be a lot more cost effective for the patient. There's not going to be nearly as much therapist time delivering the medication, but for the patient, I will say this, I think it is probably more disruptive to a patient's lifestyle. So you're going to save on costs. I don't know if you're going to save on time though. So you're not going to have the $20,000 treatment regimens like compass or maps are talking about, but for mm. a patient, I mean, coming out of that experience, I think you need to take a week off after that one. In my humble opinion, I mean, you have. I mean, at least a day. I mean, you shouldn't, you definitely shouldn't be doing a substance like that. At least a day. Don't do it on a Sunday and go back to your corporate job the next day because you might quit, quite frankly. Yeah. Yeah. The integration component is incredibly important. And I think where this is really relevant is in the surge of ketamine assisted therapy. Yes. Because some organizations are much better at it than others. Some integration. There's sessions before, during, and after. It's a huge component. Other ones, they're kind of like, well, it's already FDA approved. Here's what we recommend. It's not as structured. Yeah. Ketamine has kind of been the wild west lately. Of yeah. And that came out of nowhere, right? This was just like a horse tranquilizer that we used for some other things. It was already had this long FDA approval. And all of a sudden we're like, oh, it might actually help with uh, mental health issues. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was pretty remarkable. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was a dissociative anesthetic for a long time. And it's still funny. You talk to nurses who are like, yeah, I'll either use morphine or ketamine, you know, to, yeah. as an anesthetic, but John Crystal really pioneered a lot of the research in, um, I think he was the one who did the first study on it. And it was 1994, if I'm not mistaken, because you had user reports of people encephalating ketamine going, wait, I think this cured my depression, at least temporarily. The tough thing with ketamine is it just doesn't seem to be as durable of an effect. People have to continue coming back to that one versus psilocybin. If you can do one or two sessions and you seem to be in remission six months plus, that is pretty remarkable. I mean, that is nice for a patient if you don't have to keep going back to an infusion clinic or, you know, even doing lozenges, you name it. So ketamine um, would also be the one that I'd, ha I'd have the most concern for with forming an addiction. If you had a less structured model and you gave them, say, a nasal spray with ketamine to use as needed, that this would be the one where I'd be more concerned about addiction than others. Absolutely. Well, the interesting thing about, yeah, I mean, the abuse potential around ketamine is like one in 10 or one in 12. So it's, it's And it's in a system, it's in a pharmaceutical model where we've already seen abuse. Yes, exactly. You do. And actually, even in China, it's, it's interesting having talked to John Crystal, so I got to give him full credit on this point, but in China where a lot of people, you know, there, there's a, a missing gene for processing alcohol. So kind of the classic, I'm gonna use the very politically incorrect term here, but the classic term Asian glow. Is that alcohol dehydrogenase? Yes, yeah. that is exactly. So there's um, it, the missing enzyme for breaking it down. But so a lot of people actually like to use ketamine because alcohol isn't viable. 
you do see a lot of ketamine abuse actually in China in particular. And it's- Oh, I didn't know that was a, that was an alternative use for it. That's cool. Yeah. It's like the third most abused compound out there. And for really bad cases of, I mean, this is people who are using it a ton and like once a day, you can actually get a lot of bladder issues. You can get bladder lesions um, where, I mean, it just, it's, it's bad. I Wait, mean, let me get really, this straight. The, this potential solution wasn't, I could drink less alcohol. It's I can take ketamine and then I can drink more alcohol. <laughs> to be fair, it doesn't, but it doesn't address you know the enzymatic issues around alcohol breakdown. It's more how can I get something that kind of makes me woozy and like that drunk feeling that isn't alcohol. So this is being used in place of a replacement to alcohol. Okay, yes, yeah. Of like I can't drink alcohol. What's something that gives me a similar effect? You know, reduces some of my inhibitions. Um, you know, that, that's kind of the use case for it. So for any of your viewers start going out and taking ketamine with alcohol. <laughs> yeah, please don't do that. <laughs> yeah, I do not recommend that at all. So, but uh, yeah, so there's risk of abuse around it though. And that is part of why I do think this medicalized framework makes a lot of sense around psychedelics is, uh, you know, we've all had our asses kicked by a few trips too. I think it makes sense to proceed with caution around quite a few. Yeah. Well, and even in the cannabis sector, especially here in California, the, the inconsistency of dosage really just created some easily preventable negative experiences for many yes. people. Like you could take a cookie and you're not sure if it's 1200 milligrams of THC or yeah. five. And you get the same thing with psilocybin, for example, if you, you know, dealers are like, Hey, this is my first flush. You know, this is a heavy one. Second flush, maybe not as much. So like Mexicana far more potent than Cubensis. Yeah. There, I mean, there is a synthetic version that they will use in research sometimes and, but that's much more expensive to produce. Yes, it is. And it's, you know, that. I still like that method, though, where at least you get consistent dosing and patients know how much they're getting on a consistent basis. And it's very purified. It's GMP grade. That is the nice thing. But there are issues around chemical synthesis, too. The yield is still pretty low. It makes it relatively expensive. Um, and there are some interesting companies out there like CB Therapeutics, for example, or SciBio that are working with some novel synthesis methods mm -hmm. that are not chemical in nature. They're actually making genetic tweaks to either yeast um, or E. coli where you feed them a substrate and they basically shit out psilocybin for lack of a better word. I mean, they, they excrete, they ingest a substrate and they excrete, they're genetically modified oh, to excrete psilocybin. Um, it, and it does seem to be higher yielding. It is compelling. My issue with um, some companies in that space has been, I don't know if that's the huge pain point here, the biggest cost pain point for psychedelic therapies will be clinician time. And that is the lion's share of the cost of a lot of these therapies. So, whether you, you know, reduce the cost of API by 50%, it's still such mm -hmm. a drop in the bucket. I just don't know if that's what people are really ultimately solving for. That's been my big hang up. Um, but in a lot of ways, it can still do a lot of good too. I mean, there's a lot mm -hmm. of chemical waste from chemically derived psilocybin or, or a lot of these other synthesis methods. And that in its own right, you know, can be damaging or who knows if it's bad for the envi environment to have all those waste products. Yeah, what I appreciate about the conversation of how the future of psychedelics is many people are addressing the issue of how do we keep costs down so that we can deliver more of the product to the general population. You know, MAPS is talking about their price point being, you know, a few thousand dollars anywhere from, I think they said they could set it in the tens of thousands, but they were actually targeting closer to two or three thousand. And then what do you do with all that profit? And they're like, oh, you know, talking about offering free services based on income. They're also talking about taking psychedelics and having more of an international distribution. How do you get this to areas that were impacted by war and things like that? Yeah, I, I completely agree. As you mentioned, the cost is gonna be very high. What we like about the medicalized models, you hold some hope of these getting reimbursed by insurers. I think if there's enough data that can be shown, you can really nip these pernicious conditions in the bud. like. PTSD or depression, they carry a lot of comorbidities. There's a lot of exogenous costs to those that, you know, not direct costs, but indirect costs carry with those conditions. If you can really address the root cause here and save insurers a lot of money, I hold hope that these could be reimbursed, which actually makes them a lot more affordable to a lot of patients than if you do this in an out of network context or a recreational context, because, you know, people who go through the underground, each session costs them two to $3,000, especially more of the high end retreat type centers. It's, it's in the, you know, right. the multiples of thousands. So um, we'll see what's going to be interesting is I actually don't know how profitable 
some of these therapies will be, even if it's priced at 10 to 20,000, that generates a lot of revenue, but there's a lot of margin, you know, a lack of margin baked into that, of if a lot of that cost is therapist time and that's going directly to the therapist, it's kind of like how much is left over for the pharmaceutical company ultimately, which will be another big question here is, are these high revenue generating, but low margin therapies as well, given there is very heavy time and cost that gets baked in to a lot of it. Right. And, and on that topic, one thing that's interesting is considering COVID, a lot of physicians had to go to a remote model. So yeah. one way to reduce cost and still reduce physician time is, you, you know, you can do things more remotely. Yeah. Well, and that's another, you know, Mind Bloom is really pioneering that with remote ketamine assisted psychotherapy right there. And there's a lot of discussions, uh, you know, psilocybin, some of the really potent ones are really hallucinogenic ones. Um, tough to tell whether, you know, patients for a first journey could do that at home. Some people are talking about group sessions too. Yeah. How do you get a group session through the FDA? You know, that's pretty unprecedented of, of how are you correlating factors there? Um, but yeah. there's a lot of different discussions of, you know, yeah, how can we bring the cost down with these? Yeah, because for psilocybin at Johns Hopkins, their model is they have two trained therapists there. The user is blindfolded and they're there for eight hours, I believe. Yeah. They intentionally extend the trip so that it lasts eight hours. That's a lot yeah. of physician time. That's a lot of therapist time. Yeah. One, two therapists, like you mentioned. Yeah. Do you need two? Could you just bring it down to one? A lot of the reason right. why we've gone with two is there has been a history of abuse previously. So they have a male and a female therapist. Just in right. case. So there is definitely an abundance of caution mentality. But, you know, on the flip side, and even with some of the dosing we have with these, there's definitely, an I mean, we go for very high dose. You're trying to achieve this mystical experience. But in pharmaceuticals, I mean, this is why we go through a phase two A studies. You do dose finding studies. Because, I mean, if you throw a bunch of Advil at a pain problem, yeah, you're going to address the problem. But the question is, what's your, what's your minimal dose you can achieve? What's your minimal dose you can ingest or take to achieve that outcome? And, you know, that's how you bring down costs. That's where you can't always throw the kitchen sink at a problem. So that's part of the yeah. question. My first pain point I would address is therapist time. I think trying to shorten the duration of the trip. Um, I don't think there's any reason you need it to be six hours versus three hours, for example, with psilocybin. If you could shorten the duration of that journey, um, that could really significantly bring down the cost. Yeah. And that's something that you can test fairly easily, but you just, you know, it needs to be funded. Yes. It needs to be funded. <laughs> you know, someone has to run the study, but it's something that can be answered with, you know, proper research design. Yeah. There needs to be some novel drug discovery. You know, psilocybin is what's called a prodrug. So you have a phosphate attached to psilocin. And when it's, so why it takes some time is when it's ingested in the body, you de it dephosphorylates. So your body has to break off the phosphate. And then the active metabolite you get is psilocin, and that's what's actually acting in the body. That's what's psychoactive here. But you could design other prodrugs of psilocin, theoretically, where it may dephosphorylate more quickly, it may operate more quickly in the body, it may clear more rapidly. Um, so there could be novel prodrugs out there, potentially, that are much more fast acting. I believe that's what Field Trip is working on mm -hmm. with their drug discovery effort. I believe it's a prodrug of psilocin, if I'm not mistaken that they think is much more rapid acting. And does this kind of go in alignment with what you were saying earlier about 5-MeO DMT, try and shorten the experience? Yes. Yeah, that's another idea there too, is, you know, shorten the experience. The trade-off with 5-MeO DMT, what people always have a question about is, do a lot of users want that experience? You know, it's like, okay, we've shortened the experience. We've shortened the duration of the trip, but would we would do users want more of a psilocybin, which is a little more gentler? then, you know, it's gentler than like 5-MeO, which can be like getting shot out of a cannon yeah. for a lot of people. So Yeah. And then on the opposite spectrum of that is something like ayahuasca that it's used in a group setting. And that's meant to last, you know, eight to 12 hours sometimes. In some cases. Yeah. That doesn't seem to be a player that's really involved in this discussion of psychedelic therapy expansion. I feel like the area that that one seems to be more appropriate is on the spiritual side related to religious freedoms in the U S and access to schedule one substances. And mm -hmm. it has this shamanic component to it in a cultural aspect. That's very different from some of these other substances. I think so. There, there is that aspect and part of it too, why not as many people have jumped on ayahuasca is it's just, there's so many different compounds acting in ayahuasca and every brew is so different depending on what 
tribe that this comes out of or, or what tradition. Right. A traditional would brew would have two ingredients, but other tribes may throw something else in there. Yeah. People toss nicotine in there. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different things. So, I mean, to really make it pharmaceutical grade is also tough. There's a few companies pioneering PharmaWaska. Um, Reconnect is, is one, and um, they're doing some interesting work around that. We're kind of taking Swiss chemistry and precision to ayahuasca, which is an area where there hasn't been a lot of precision and, I, and probably every brew is different from every previous brew in some way. Um, but that's where it's just, how do you take something through FDA trials where there's so many different compounds that are, are acting in, in that? It's tough to really isolate what the effect might be coming from. You so, can identify a lot of things that are in it, but you can't explain what's happening, what it exactly. does, why We're, it's there. Yep. When you have combo products and you take them through FDA clinical trials, you usually have to run multi-way clinical trials then. So if you have, let's say you have three active compounds in a drug, usually in your phase two, the FDA is going to say, okay, you need to run individual trials on each isolated compound and then also the combined drug so we can see what really explains the effect. Because it's like, what if you're combining multiple things, but two of them really don't explain it. It's really just one that's in the, you know, in that formulation that really explains the effect. So that's where clinical trials can get quite a bit more expensive as well. Right. So, and with ayahuasca, it's really tough for us to know, is it how much MAOI inhibitor do you need in there? How much DMT do you need in there? You know, some people, like I mentioned, will toss nicotine. I, I'm no ayahuasca expert, but I know a lot of different tribes will have different formulations. And yeah. so it's tough to know what's, what are the ones that really you know, are the most efficacious. Right. And there's even one researcher that has, I believe, bipolar disorder, and he's looking at which, if there are specific indigenous plants that you can use to offset that particular contraindication, because normally someone who's bipolar will go into like a state of mania if they yes. were to consume ayahuasca. That's interesting. Yeah. If you're doing a lot, I mean, it is an MAOI inhibitor or so, um, or MAO inhibitor. So, I mean, you, know, you do run the risk of serotonin syndrome too. If you were doing that a lot, um, there are some risks around that if you're, you're flooding your system with too much serotonin, or I've heard of some cases where when brews have nicotine, if people are really active vapors or smokers, you can get nicotine poisoning as well. So, I mean, there's, there's right. still some risks that's, you know, that's where we don't always know with these things. And again, I say proceed with caution. And ironically, or one of the challenges that people have depression, so they're usually on a drug that's an antidepressant, an SSRI, yes. which is usually contraindicated for some of these substances. Majorly. You actually have to come off them before you start them. You should not take an antidepressant, an SSRI with an MAO inhibitor. It's a huge because risk. of its influence on yes. serotonin receptors. On exactly. And, and even 5-MeO-DMT, it seems to be contraindicated as well. That's another big, we know with, with MDMA, without a doubt. It's a big risk, but you have, yeah, you have these issues where the way SSRIs work is they block the reuptake of serotonin and then and, or you, you block, you know, you're, you're blocking the reuptake of that. And then MAOI inhibitors, you know, MAO, it, it's an enzyme that breaks down a lot of these aminergic molecules, these neurotransmitters in the brain. So if you're blocking that, all of a sudden you're not breaking those down in the body and you're like overloading the body with these neurotransmitters. And it can make you go haywire in a whole host of ways. So um, that's a big yeah. risk around it. But imagine when we get to a point where some of these psychedelic therapy options will be the first thing we try instead of what we try when we're treatment resistant. Yeah. Then you don't have to worry about people coming off of a drug that doesn't work and having experienced the side effects from that. They can just try something that has a higher potential chance to work. Totally agree. I I mean, I, I think that would, and it would be, it would probably address much more root causes than a lot of the spiritual and existential I, angst that it's really but also talk about cost savings in a medical model totally. like if we can get it right the first time that's going to be huge savings well, people, in physician time therapist time the drug cost everything yeah and the comorbidities of i mean loss of libido you think how that affects relationships weight yeah. gain as well and and the whole i mean the whole range of effects that has to whether it can cause heart disease later or just weight gain, how that affects, you know, that can make you more depressed in a lot of ways. So just across right. the board with SSRIs, I'm saying, so I'm in complete agreement. And another thing too, is, I mean, I just think depression is so, that's, that is an indication so ripe for subtyping. Like the fact that we say that someone who has a cancer diagnosis and or a terminal diagnosis of some sort and is depressed has the same type of depression 
is someone in their 20s who just went through a breakup or just has this creeping depression that they don't really know why because there may be some genetic underpinning or where you're also seeing the microbiome in a lot of ways could probably explain a lot of mood disorders. To say that's the same form of depression and use the same diagnostic scales, I think is crazy from a regulatory and medical standpoint. And so, you know, there's also, we're seeing that too for like cancer patients, there's no statistically significant effect in SSRIs to treat people who have a cancer diagnosis and are depressed at the same time. But psilocybin is highly, highly effective for that patient subpopulation. Right. Um, and in that too, we also need to develop better validated scales to look at this totally. larger variety of mental health issues, because a lot of them weren't built with a very diverse or robust population. Yes. Like we have so many other subpopulations that we need to look at. So I think something we need to consider is constantly developing new tools as well. Yeah. Because that's, I mean, that's how research works. If it's not a validated tool, you're going to get, you know, there's gonna be issues with you using it. Garbage in, garbage out. Exactly. Yeah. You're not even, and that's why a lot of drugs fail in clinical trials too. There's actually a whole push. There's a whole other motif in the biotech world is drug repurposing, realizing that no one, maybe this drug failed because we picked the wrong patient population, that we were too broad in our selection. And had we been a little bit more precise, and we could have been, you know, for schizophrenia, there's probably as many as eight, 80 subtypes of schizophrenia, for example. So that's for schizophrenia that afflicts 1% of the population. Mm -hmm. Think about depression. If you have 400 million people plus globally suffering from depression, you probably have far more subtypes of depression. And, and I think as an interesting example, I mean, look at what Sage Therapeutics did with Silreso for postpartum depression. Like to think that a mother who just had a child and is experiencing depression where that has a very deep, you know, neurochemical root to what's probably causing that. If your hormones are going crazy in, you know, during pregnancy and post-pregnancy, that's a very different type of depression. Again, from a 20 year old experiencing it after a breakup versus someone in their seventies who is, you know, nearing the end of life and facing that existential angst. I mean, those are, and so, right. you know, Sage carved out PPD is an interesting sub -ind indication, a subtype of depression and developed a totally new medication also to address that. So I think that same theme holds for a lot of other, you know, a lot of other therapies that could address different subtypes of depression. Yeah, I mean, it definitely helps to have more tailored options. But I also think with something like depression and um, a lack of connection to other people, you know, psychedelics are can be great for that. I know one of the issues we were having at a, one of the universities here in California is just student suicidality. There was just, they're having the highest numbers of undergraduate students killing themselves. That's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Huge. You know, they're surrounded by people. This was even before COVID. I mean, the data after COVID, you know, that's going to be increased isolation and things. But this was even pre-COVID. Yeah. It was just an increasing problem where you're surrounded by students and peers, you have friends, but there's still this, you know, depression and lack of connection. Yeah. It just, it, it does break your heart. I mean, they say cities can be the loneliest places on the planet. You know, you're surrounded by so yeah. many people, but you feel so disengaged in some ways that I agree. I think the ability, especially this is where the MDMA class is really interesting and, and what a company like Tactogen is doing. That's one we're invested in. I find really interesting that, you know, MDMA is great, but there, it can be really rough on the body. The come up experience can be pretty jarring for some people. And there's probably gentler forms of MDMA that can be developed that still have that those same intactogenic qualities and, and make you a lot more sympathetic and, and empathetic to your fellow man or woman. I think it can engender a lot of connection. And we haven't even hit on psychedelics for, you know, marriage counseling or marriage therapy as well. I mean, oh, yeah. that, it's a whole other area too, that it's a whole other therapeutic area we haven't really explored, but I think holds a lot of potential. I think that one will be an easy expansion for family marriage therapists. You know, it's just an easy add on, get some additional training. And then I think that'll be a great tool in their toolbox. Oh, totally. And, and the anecdotal evidence is pretty compelling around that one too. I mean, I, yeah. I firsthand see marriages go from like probably nearing divorce to totally happy, healthy now due to MDMA and, and psychedelic therapy more broadly. So, yeah, what I thought was interesting about um, some of the MDMA therapeutic models is they'll actually have users be blindfolded for part of it. Yes. When normally when you think of MDMA, you think of visual enhancement and then to put a blindfold on and really internalize with that substance, I think it completely changes the yeah. experience. 
Yeah. I, you know, I'm a big fan of blindfolding, at least for the tryptamines, for sure. There's some interesting, interesting companies that have emerged around kind of VR, AR headsets for psychedelic therapy. I'm really bearish on that category. Actually, I think your mind is probably the best movie theater out there and kind of having it more come from within than from without. Um, I, I like that a lot more, but I'm in agreement on MDMA. That's been an interesting one where for me, MDMA, I, I have always viewed in a very pro-social context um, rather than kind of like in a room one-on-one -on -one with an eye mask on. For me, MDMA, I've always loved as kind of something to connect with friends or something in a much more, you know, social manner. And I think there's a lot of therapy you can get out of that as well. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, to, to each his own, I guess, on that way. Yeah, I'm but in it. its diversity, is it, you know, it's also great for PTSD, we're noticing. Yes. So it has, you know, it has a wide variety of ways that it can help therapeutically. Well, to your point, it's probably for addressing PTSD, the eye mask armchair approach probably makes a lot more sense because you have to go, you, there is some priming, there is integration. We have to re-experience that traumatic memory. And the mechanism mm -hmm. neurologically seems to be that, that MDMA, it has a hyponesic effect. So amnesia, you forget things, hyponesia, you can actually conjure up memories. Um, so it'll bring back suppressed memories but at the same time shuts down the amygdala. So really kind of takes offline the amygdala, which can be your fear center in a lot of ways, or kind of that, that part of your brain that when something's bubbling up, you react and suppress it again, and it shuts that down. We're able to relive that memory. But I think you need a blindfold and kind of a more, um, you know, a more psychotherapeutic approach when you're addressing that ailment versus other things, if you're addressing social anxiety or um, marriage autism, therapy, marriage therapy, or <laughs> autism too is another interesting one as well, where you kind of have decreased affect and kind of limited, you know, there's like a social impairment there. MDMA could be a lot more effective in a more kind of pro-social. As you can tell, it's a, it's a thriving ecosystem. So there's no, no shortage, shortage of entertainment in this field. All right. So before we wrap it up, I just want to talk about where you think things are going, the direction they're going, what kind of milestones are we looking for in the advancement for psychedelic therapies? Yeah. So I think the first, first big milestone will be MAPS, MAPS's MDMA therapy for PTSD, and that should get FDA approval. They're wrapping up their phase three. That should commercialize in 2022, maybe 2023. Um, at the very latest, but in that range. So that will be a pretty remarkable milestone that someone will be able to go legally get prescription MDMA and take it with a therapist. I mean, who, yeah, that, that's pretty incredible. For someone, yeah, going through the but, Nancy Reagan era, whoever would have thought 30 years or so later we'd be at this point. The war on drugs. Yeah, yeah it's exactly. awful. Oh, and real quick, back on the MDMA approval, the data was so good that they were granted breakthrough therapy status. So yes. their initial data was way better than what they expected. So that's part of why this is going quick. That was the really remarkable part was for MAPS, even Compass, um, Spravato, which Janssen commercialized, you know, that's that's the intranasal version of S-ketamine. Um, they, you know, it was like the, the FDA was saying the patient, the patient need is so large and so unmet by the current standard. And these seem so much more effective. But yeah, a lot of psychedelic therapies have gotten breakthrough therapy designation, which shortens the FDA approval time by 30%. So it does make the time to market a little bit quicker on a lot of these therapies. So yeah, MAPS was pretty remarkable. So that's the first one. Um, Compass Pathways is advancing their psilocybin therapy for treatment-resistant depression. And that's in phase 2B right now. If I'm not mistaken, we'll get a readout on that in 2022. Backing up a second, I mentioned Spravato too. I haven't talked about right. that a ton. That is something that is already on the market. You know, intranasal, it's S-ketamine. So it's an, an, an antiomer of ketamine. There's a right hand and a left hand version of, of the same ketamine molecule. So they took one of those versions, the more potent one. I mean, that, that hit the market to a little bit more muted success than people originally thought it would have. It seems like there's more uptake now on that drug, now that there's billing, you know, there's medical billing codes around it and it can actually get reimbursed, but had a little bit of a rocky road um, in the beginning. So back to Compass, you know, they're going through phase 2B. So Compass, assuming they succeed, should be about 2025 that that therapy commercializes. Um, and then there's a number, you know, that are hitting the market. For example, we're investors in Reset Pharma. They're working on psilocybin for existential distress. And the initial category will really be cancer-related depression and anxiety. Dr. Stephen Ross from NYU pioneered a lot of that research. They'll be going back into phase two. So that'll probably be around 2025. That also commercializes. And we also have 
policy shifts happening throughout the United States. So we had Oregon legalize psilocybin in 2020. So I believe they're on two year hold while they're building up the regulatory component of it. Yep. There's some stuff happening here in California as far as bills to decriminalize. And I think it's a trend that's becoming more popular. It's picking up too. And you look, you know, DC, Ann Arbor, Denver, there's been a lot of decriminalization efforts where it's going to mute the, the commercial potential. I mean, the ability for to start a business is going to be limited, but for someone to, you know, take these drugs and not go to jail, which I think should absolutely be the case. I, I don't think anyone should go to jail for drug use. You should go to jail if you ingest a drug and do something harmful to people, you know, where that's right. A we have a system for that. It's called the legal system. Yes. If you, yeah, if someone's drunk and they hit somebody with their car, there are consequences. Exactly. We have a, we have a system. We, for exactly. It. We already have, yes, we already have methods in place to address those crimes, but for just, you know, altering your consciousness, that should not be illegal in any way. But, um, so we have a lot of those movements and then, you know, a lot of our pipeline for nor these third generation psychedelics, these new chemical entities that are being discovered and advanced preclinically, that's probably quite a ways out. You know, the FDA process takes a long time and to go from just discovery to commercialization of a drug is a seven to 10 year process. Um, so it's one of those things where you have to be patient, um, but on, on the back end, I do think there is a lot of commercial potential and there's a lot more knowledge you can develop around that compound too, understanding what's explaining the, you know, the, med the medicinal effects of it, understanding really what the true risks are. So you do, you know, you, you limit the risk liability in a lot of ways by taking that pathway too. Yeah. And then back on the policy side of it, my understanding is there isn't anything with an expected change in FDA schedule classification. Like that's not something that is on the books seen anytime soon. I don't think, no. but that is something that could dramatically impact how things shape. In yeah. The they, I don't see a world where the DEA just reschedules these for for no reason i mean look at cannabis i mean cannabis hasn't been rescheduled in. exactly <laughs> exactly what i do see though is if you approve a drug via an fda clinical trial process then by default the the dea has to reschedule that compound so you know you look at cocaine is actually scheduled too because it is a numbing agent there actually is some known medicinal use cases so if you find a medical benefits and schedule one is risk extreme risk of harm to the user and no known medical use case and both of those criteria have to be met if you find that there's a medical use case you eliminate one so by default you're at least schedule two or maybe more like schedule three or so if i'm not mistaken i think ketamine is schedule three maybe four i have to yeah yeah ketamine's schedule three okay it is confirm. all right all yeah. right so you're right perfect all right <laughs> um it's a lower scheduling where you'll probably have a black box warning but at least it doesn't carry kind of the highest criminal offense um, there and, and you can, you know, if it's being prescribed for a medical use case that is completely above board and legal. So that's what we also like about this medical pathway. It's kind of a backdoor route to legalization. Like you can, rather than trying to kind of like storm, you know, storm the fortress and go by ballot box and like change a lot of public opinion, <laughs> you can go within the channels that we already have created as a society. And it's more of a Trojan horse to achieving de facto legalization of a lot of these compounds, which I really like that. So yeah, there I could see psychedelics being more in that category, very likely. Yeah. Well, it's nice that you have invested in companies across a broad space because there's so much that's going to be happening and that is happening right now. So it's going to have, it's going to cover a lot of different areas. Yeah. And that is the beauty of taking a fund approach to this and, and why I like the Palo Santo strategy is it's tough to know which direction this ecosystem will head. Um, and even whether, you know, to your point, maybe the legalization movement takes hold far faster than we ever thought. I mean, we do have a little bit of exposure to companies like Guella um, in case that does happen. But the beauty of a fund, we can be very diversified, where if any one of these takes off, I think it'll be a huge hit. And some, you know, for whatever reason, the, just the clinical path won't go that direction. So it's a very de-risked approach. And we take a very, our thinking at Palo Santo is much more of a portfolio approach. So we don't like to get judged by any one individual company and its success or failure. It's really looking at the portfolio and whether in aggregate that's a success or failure. And I think we've got a lot of the right picks where, you know, this space can head in a lot of different directions and we're exposed in a lot of different ways where if it heads in any one direction, um, there's going to be some really big winners in the portfolio. Yeah. So are, is there a particular area that you feel like where you don't have an organization that you're working with that you think would really 
that you'd like to work with, an area that's missing that you that isn't currently being covered that you think would be beneficial? It's an, it's an interesting question. I'd say there's probably more on the tech side that we would like to do. I mean, we have a lot of exposure to biotech. I think there's a lot of good that tech can do in this world to either limit the amount of time a therapist is needed, or even more importantly, just developing biomarkers around the space. Back to our point on how we diagnose depression and the endpoints we use um, to determine success or failure in a lot of these clinical trials, they're so archaic um, that I wish we were, I wish there were more companies out there. And I think there probably are some of which we don't have a ton of exposure to that, um, you know, are developing novel digital tools to really track patient data. So we have some exposure to a company called Kasana, um, and I really like what they're doing. I wish we had a larger investment in Kasana, quite frankly. MindStrong had pioneered some work in this. It's called digital phenotyping, where you can get a lot of data from patients around voice data, you know, keypad data, how you're typing, even just how many people are you interacting with? Could that be a proxy for isolation? It's a lot of good data in your phone that's more objective than filling out a DSM-5 survey. Um, that could be an indicator of depression or relief from depression. And I'd say if there's a direction I'd really like to head more in, it would be that. And the, you know, the success rate in CNS drug discovery, so central nervous system, which is kind of your broad umbrella term for um, mental health disorder drug discovery, it's very, the, the success rate is very low in that field. But when you add biomarkers to small molecule drug discovery, it does seem to enhance the efficacy and the odds of success in clinical trials. So finding more novel ways to pair biomarkers with these clinical trials, I would love to see more of that. Um, and probably some of it, I haven't seen enough opportunities out there. Um, and some of it, you know, I'd love to have more exposure to a company like Kassan. I think what they're doing is really, really cool. Yeah. And that just really goes back to what you were saying earlier. It helps reduce cost. It helps be more efficient with resources. You can collect a variety of information. So just, you know, it's it's more information to help move things forward. Yeah, exactly. So, and you think about the value of data there too. There, there's a tremendous amount of value, even if it's anonymized data, I think it should be anonymized, but there's a tremendous amount of value in that. Of, of I mean, that's why Facebook data. is popular, right? Like they collect so much data. Exactly, exactly. I think if you did more, if you took more of an Apple Watch approach, or at least they anonymize it and protect it, you know, <laughs> More than Facebook, yeah. I think, is willing to kind of give away anyone's data. And, and, yeah, and we don't, and you don't want to collect data to sell people things more effectively. You want to collect data to be more efficient in helping them with whatever they're seeking treatment yeah, for. Yeah, that's the one risk you have here. That's the end clients. goal. Yeah, when you're dealing with healthcare data and really, you know, you don't want to end up in a Gattaca type situation where, uh, you know, people's futures are being determined from birth. That's kind of the dystopian view. But on the flip side, you know, we the way we measure and track mental health, I just think, so archaic. The fact that the, really the only ways we do it are you fill out a survey and it's so subjective. Um, there's a lot of ways to improve it. There's another company, Alto, Alto um, Neuroscience, which is working on you know using EEG scans as a potential biomarker as well. So measuring brain wave scans and using that as a proxy to detect mental health disorders or relief from them as well. So um, I like a lot of those approaches. Yeah, I love anything that's innovative and looks at a problem differently. I'm always excited to see what happens. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, this has been an awesome conversation. I'm excited. You know, it was great to hear about all the different organizations you're working with and really what's happening and the direction we're moving in. Did you have any final words, anything you want to say before we wrap this up? All I can say is I think the future 10 years from now is going to look way wackier than we ever even thought. So when when I got into this space along with Daniel Goldberg, my other business partner, Tony Eisenberg, as well, four years ago. Um, we didn't even know if a, for, a viable for-profit model would emerge. And you know, seeing a tie go public at a over a $3 billion valuation just two months ago, um, if you asked me if that future would be in the next two years, back in 2018, 2019, I would have said no way. Um, and now it's here. And even the legalization waves in Oregon, like you mentioned, the push in California. I think a lot of this, don't underestimate how once you hit that key inflection point, how fast things can move. And I think we saw that in cannabis. Um, we even saw it with gay marriage as well. You just talk about themes of things that were taboo and there was a very rapid cultural shift. I think we're going to see the same thing around psychedelics. So Yeah, makes me think of the theory of innovation where just things just really take off. Yes, it's that exponential curve. So I think it's going to move 
you know, everyone, I, I remember when I was wrestling with this even two years ago and I had a lot of friends who were like, you are absolutely freaking crazy to even be entertaining this idea. And we're so conservative. And if anything, I wish I'd leaned in more. I wish I'd been a little more risk prone yeah. than risk reversed. You, you have to be a little crazy. You have to think in phase shifts, not incrementally. And I think this is that kind of order of magnitude leap forward that society needs on so many fronts. So yeah, to achieve major milestones, you have to be a little crazy. It requires yes. it. it. It needs to be that idea that's like just crazy, you know, a, a little crazy. Enough people are saying it's crazy, but when you lift up the hood, it kind of makes sense. It's like right in that middle zone is where you have the real breakthrough opportunities. And I think that's right where psychedelics lie. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see what the future holds. It's gonna be, it's gonna be an exciting journey for sure. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, we'll have to do a recap in five years from now and we can see what we said now and then where the world sits then, so. Yeah, yeah, we'll follow up. Well, it's been awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I've had a great conversation. Yeah, really enjoyed it. If you enjoyed this conversation, share it with someone who you think will connect with it and help us move consciousness.